Dreams in every country. Dreams, you know we can work together and learn what we need to meet the challenge. Hello and welcome to the ISA Conference Rewind video series. I'm Jamie Vidick, Director of Educational Products and Services at the International Society of Arbor Culture. Today, we're excited to bring you a presentation by Dr. Greg Moore. Dr. Moore will discuss ring barking, girdling, and the vascular connection between tree roots and crowns. This presentation was originally given in the 2022 ISA Virtual Conference, and the views are those of the presenter. If you are interested in tree physiology in general, or arboricultural treatments for ring barking and girdling in particular, I expect you will really find this presentation quite fascinating. Now sit back and enjoy. Good day to everyone at the ISA virtual conference in 2022. Uh, I'm delighted to be here online. Uh, regret not being able to see people face to face, uh, but I'm very keen to be talking about a topic that's uh, interested me for many, many years, and that's ring barking and girdling of trees, how much vascular connection do you need between the roots and the crown of a tree? And before I begin, uh, I want to make sure that we're talking the same language, that we uh, have the terminology correct. And so during this presentation, I'm going to use two terms, ring barking and girdling, uh, which are very often used in our industry uh, as synonyms. So there people use them interchangeably and some other terms as well. But I'm advocating for the use of the terms ring barking and girdling to mean very specific and different things. So you'll notice here, I've got a formal definition of what I mean by ring barking. And that's a circumferal, circumferential cut around the trunk of the tree, which removes a band of tissue to the depth of and including the cambium. It removes a band which contains cork and cork cambium, phloem tissues and the cambium. And so it has an immediate impact on the translocation of materials in the phloem tissues. On the other hand, girdling is again a circumferential cut around the trunk of the tree, which removes a band of tissue to the depth of the active or functional xylem tissues, effectively a deeper cut. And such a cut removes a band which contains the cork and cork cambium, phloem tissues, the cambium, and the current season's active or functional xylem. Now, it takes out the growth ring, if you like. And so it has an immediate impact on both the translocational and transpirational processes. So these are two terms that I hope you'll become familiar with over the course of this presentation. I hope those definition, definitions are meaningful to you. And from my perspective, if we could use those in a technically precise way, it would save us a lot of confusion when it comes to describing what happens to trees. And that could be important, for example, if you're dealing with a report that ends up before a court of law. Now, ring barking and girdling can occur for a whole range of reasons. But most of us will assume that we're talking about human caused ring barking or girdling. Uh, and of course, this is, this is very common. Uh, it was a common agricultural practice and still is in some parts of the world for killing uh, off uh, native vegetation to clear paddocks for farming. Uh, foresters killed selected trees with it. Uh, orchardists kills uh, selected branches, for example, to control vegetative growth or uh, uh, fruit size and yield. And of course, then we have all the accidental human uh, and unintended ring barking and girdling from people putting wires and various things and ropes around the trunks of a tree, uh, sometimes from poor staking, uh, from mowers and what we call whipper snippers or what you would call brush cutters in the United States. And then we've got poor uh, propagation and planting techniques, which lead to the girdling of the lower parts of the trunk and root systems. And then there are those spectacular acts of vandalism or vehicle accidents. So lots and lots of causes of ring barking and girdling due to human activity. And some of these go back many, many decades and centuries indeed. So what you see on your screen at the moment 
is an etching of ring bark, ring barking trees that was used as a very common practice here in Australia to clear very large swathes of land. And these are professional uh, ring barkers who are clearing land back in the 1800s. Uh, naturally caused ring barking or girdling um, also takes place. And uh, very often it's by uh, uh, animals, grazing animals, uh, perhaps horses, uh, birds. We have birds here, cockatoos, uh, which are very large parrots that can strip large uh, slabs of bark off trees. Uh, tunneling insects uh, getting under the bark and, and working their way through the bark and cambium tissue, tissues. And of course, various fungal diseases such as cholera can all uh, contribute to girdling and ring barking. Uh, we can also get uh, circling of roots, as I've mentioned earlier, from uh, poor nursery uh, techniques, but it can also happen naturally. And it may happen, for example, with seedlings that develop in uh, crevices. Uh, here in Australia, and I suspect in many parts of the US, particularly on the West Coast, um, bushfires uh, and, and wildfires in the last uh, few years have certainly brought home to us the damage that fires can do to uh, both forest trees and trees that are along roads uh, and in uh, peri-urban parts of towns and cities. And then we have rodents and other animals that can ring bark. So ring barking and girdling, really quite common phenomena, uh, very often because of uh, human uh, causes, but sometimes due to uh, uh, natural phenomena as well. On the screen at the moment, uh, I'm hoping that you can see uh, the base of a large tree that fell over. Uh, this tree, 24 metres tall, so a large tree, been in the ground for well over a decade. And what you're looking at uh, in this particular photograph is the base of the tree where the root system should be. There was no root system, the tree fell over. And so we excavated a, a number of these sites. And here are two examples of trees that had been uh, badly propagated, uh, were very seriously uh, uh, suffering from circular and girdling root systems, were planted out badly, and you can see in both of these instances, uh, there is a very, very poor development of the root system be because the roots had circled the base of the tree and basically cut off the supply. In effect, they'd had ring barked or girdled the tree. Um, and you may ask, well, how could trees survive with such uh, a limited uh, connection? And you can see here the connection uh, between the one root and the trunk of this tree is only a couple of uh, centimetres across. And the answer is they were growing in very good conditions for a number of years. Uh, all of the carbohydrate remained above the ground, so they grew very well until, of course, they started to fall over because they had no roots and because uh, they started to lack nutrients and water. So if you consider ring barking and girdling as different phenomena, then we, we ought to look at the, the physiology of how these work and because they're quite different. So when you look at ring barking, uh, the first thing you do is you remove the bark and cambium. It has an Im immediate impact on translocation and phloem tissue. And what, what happens is that water and nutrient transport continues because the xylem tissues remain undamaged. So the removal of phloem tissues affects the transport of complex organic molecules such as sugars, amino acids and hormones, as well as other simpler substances dissolved in the phloem sap. Now, transport of these substances from roots to foliage and from stem above the uh, region of uh, the ring bark stem is halted, but so too is transport from the foliage to the root system, especially of photosynthates and hormones. So what we find is that the transport through the phloem tissues and its impact on tree physiology can also vary according to the season. So we're looking at what's going on with the movement of a whole range of complex organic molecules from the roots to the shoots, but also from the shoots to the roots. And this can uh, be impacted by what's going on in different seasons.
So during periods of active growth, when photosynthetic activity is high, transport is predominantly basy petal. That means from foliage to roots. In deciduous trees coming out of dormancy in early spring, transport is predominantly acropetal, i.e. from roots to shoots as carbohydrate that was stored in the roots is mobilized to facilitate bud burst and leaf, pro leaf production. So what we find is that translocation and phloem transport is essentially a symplastic movement of substances through the interconnected cytoplasm of interconnected living cells. Now I've used the word interconnected there more than once deliberately so that you get the idea this is living material and materials are being transported through these connection of living cells. And we'll come back to this and the symplast and the apoplast in a few minutes time. So what usually happens when you ring bark and girdling is the interruption to the flow of carbohydrates and a rapid depletion of carbohydrates. The most immediate effect of these changes in transport is that hormones synthesized in the roots no longer travel above the zone of ring barking, and those produced by the foliage no longer get to the root. In other words, you've started to disrupt the entire metabolism of the tree. So over the longer term, what really happens, though, is the failure of the photosynthate to reach the root system. And that has very significant consequences that can ultimately kill the tree. For some time after ring barking, um, growth and uh, branch and trunk incremental increase uh, may continue above the zone of ring barking because you've still got photosynthesis occurring. And you might actually find that the condition of the foliage above the ring bark uh, trunk improves and growth rates increase because all the carbohydrate that's being produced in the foliage remains above the ring bark section of the trunk. None reaches the root system. So what usually happens is that the trunk above the ring bark zone increases in girth. Often there's a noticeable swelling above the cut, whereas below the cut, growth virtually slows and ultimately ceases. Immediately after ring barking, most trees have sufficient carbohydrate reserves in their root cells to maintain an active cell metabolism and root growth for a period of time. But as time passes, the reserves are gradually consumed, at which point growth ceases and root cells start to starve and die because of lack of carbohydrate. As soon as that happens, water and nutrient uh, uptake is then affected and the, trees, the tree starts to shed foliage, becomes chlorotic, and finally, and often quite suddenly, the tree wilts as the plant above the zone of ring barking dies. So what you find here is that quite often the ordinary person that sees a large old ring bark tree thinks the tree is going to be okay because nothing happens immediately. Water and nutrients are still moving because you haven't damaged the xylem tissues, but eventually the root system starves and the tree will die. Large tree, this could take somewhere between two to five years. Of course, if there are other environmental stresses such as drought or flooding or waterlogging, uh, the decline of the tree will be accelerated and things will happen faster. So here you see some typical examples of when you've done, uh, you've, you've, you've sort of ring barked the tree and you can see the swelling is illustrated in this slide here. Now, if we go to the real world, here is a, a tree that's been planted in a street uh, and you can see that it's been ring barked by the paving and you can see that characteristic swelling that's starting to develop above where the ring barking cuts have been made. Uh, that tree, by the way, was removed shortly after uh, I took this photograph uh, because it was doomed not to uh, survive. 
You don't have to have full ring barking um, of, of a, a plant for there to be significant uh, issues with the transport system. And you can see here uh, large wounds and large patches of ring barking on branches can also be an issue. But I'm tending to focus on ring barking and girdling of the trunk. The width and the depth of the cut affects the tree's responses to ring barking. So quite often, if someone ring barks a tree or if uh, uh, an animal ring barks a tree and the band is only narrow, might only be 75 to 100 millimetres, a healthy, vigorous tree may grow over that without any problems at all and resume its normal growth cycle. But if you've got a very large depth um, or, or, or section of bark removed, then the tree doesn't have the reserves, the callus production isn't sufficiently fast enough, and that tree then is effectively ring barked or girdled as the case may be. Now, I said earlier that we would come back and consider both the symplast and apoplast. And for those of you that are uh, interested in how all of the physiology works, I remind you that when you're looking at a woody tree, uh, you have the connections of the living cells, that is all of the cytoplasm in all of the living cells uh, and their connections and the little uh, uh, plasmodesmata that connect between cells to cell. And that's called the symplast, the living system, and the phloem tissues and phloem transport use that living system. We also have the xylem tissues, uh, large hollow vessels or elements, as the case may be, uh, it, depending on whether you've got uh, conifers or uh, angiosperms. And these uh, have no cytoplasm in them. They're effectively uh, dead cells or physiologically inert, and they're connected to all the cell walls. And so you've got a second system. And the way I think of a tree is that you've actually got three things working at once. You've got all of the living stuff called the symplast. You've got the xylem tissues and all of the cell walls and cell spaces that make up the apoplast. And very often when we're talking about the anatomy of a tree, we're very conscious of what's going on in the phloem tissues, what the ordinary person would call the bark or the xylem tissues, the ordinary person would call the wood but we forget about all of the cell walls that are there as part of that apoplastic system. And you need to think about those when you're looking at trees that have been ring barked or girdled. Now, if we come to girdling and we've talked about ring barking, which was the removal of the phloem tissue and cambium, um, what happens there is quite dramatic because it affects both the phloem tissue and transport through the xylem tissue in transpiration. In the effect really is that when you girdle and you've taken out the uh, functional current season uh, and active xylem, you've immediately interfered with the water and nutrient supply. And so really what can happen if you've got a warm windy day, the effect of that girdling will be almost immediate because wilting starts literally within minutes or within hours. And for most of the canopy in the trunk above the girdled cut, uh, permanent wilting will be reached in somewhere between 24 and 48 hours, depending on the size of the tree and the environmental conditions. So girdling is a very effective method of killing plant tissues above the cut. The effects are immediate and it's a very effective and efficient way of killing a tree. So, uh, of course, you've got the transport through phloem tissue, the transport of water and nutrients can be both symplastic and apoplastic, whereas in the phloem tissue, it's only symplastic. Um, so what we find here is that there is movement of materials through the cell walls uh, and intercellular spaces. And these, this is quite important because very often, if you're only thinking of functional xylem and phloem tissue, if you think of a, a large tree that's had a cut made through it and 
obviously the xylem and phloem tissues have been damaged. But if you stop the cut, then the tissue immediately above the cut often remains healthy, calluses produced. And you might say to yourself, where is the water and nutrients coming from? And the answer is it's coming through all of those interconnected uh, cell walls that are maintaining a water supply above the cut. So that's one of the things that you may have wondered about. The other thing I should point out is that when we think about uh, most woody trees, we think of the, uh, uh, the anatomy as being typical. In other words, you've got your xylem tissues, your growth rings, your cambium, and on the outside of that, you've got your phloem tissues. But there are various species that have what we call anomalous secondary growth, where you might get alternating rings of cambia, xylem, phloem, cambium, xylem, phloem. And this happens, for example, in some species of the Myrtaceae. And of course, coming from Australia, where eucalypts are so common, we know that that does happen in some eucalypt species. So these anomalous um, anatomies make uh, the response of the trees quite different from what you might expect. And sometimes you, you have people who've ring barked a species, nothing seems to happen because you've got this uh, anomalous secondary growth. And in some species, it's not just rings, but you have lobes as well. So just a couple of um, uh, important physiological and other responses to ring barking or girdling. Um, some of these effects you'd probably know. Uh, if the width of the cut is narrow, then the tree may simply grow over the cut with callus, and that callus may differentiate in a matter of weeks to months, and it's almost as if nothing has happened. So a healthy, vigorous tree uh, can often um, grow over 100 to 150 millimetre uh, ring barking or girdling, uh, provided it has sufficient carbohydrate reserves. Uh, if the wounds are large, the tree will respond by producing callus at the margins uh, of the cuts. And it's then just a matter of time as to whether there is sufficient um, callus produced in a reasonable time to bridge the gap and for normal tree growth to resume. Um, spring, particularly early in the season, is typified by very fast responses to wounding and very rapid callus production. So what this means is if you've got ring barking or girdling of a, of a tree, a healthy, vigorous tree, when that ring barking or girdling is done, can impact and affect the way the tree responds. So if, you, if, you're, if you're looking at, say, vandalism of a tree and they happen to vandalise the tree uh, in perhaps late winter or early spring, then quite often the tree will respond by producing a massive, a massive amount of callus and simply grow on, uh, which you probably wouldn't expect. Uh, if the tree has dormant buds, such as axillary buds or epicormic buds, or what we call lignotuberous or basal burl uh, buds below the cuts, these will often be stimulated by uh, either, either or both ring barking or girdling because you've interfered particularly with the auxin movement uh, down from the foliage. And sometimes these buds will develop sufficiently fast and large enough, and they will then supply uh, a photosynthetic area that can feed the root system so you might find that if those shoots start to develop, then the tree has a good root system. Uh, it still has all of its foliage above the cut and the callus that might be produced over a period of time that could take months or even a couple of years, those shoots can really enable a tree to recover. So this, those shoots, those, uh, uh, if you like, epicormic, axillary or lignotuberous or basal burl shoots, can actually provide you with a way of seeing whether the tree is going to overcome the effects of damage from ring barking or girdling. Um, and th if that happens, sometimes even though the cut never grows over, the tree might uh, survive for many years, uh, decades after it's been ring barked because it's still getting carbohydrate 
from the shoots below the cut, feeding the root system, so to speak. Uh, usually what happens in those cases, though, is eventually environmental stresses such as drought, um, waterlogging or insect grazing bring about the demise of the tree. Um, just a couple of other points that I'd like to make uh, in relation to this and, and to provide some um, uh, examples, if you like, of, of, of work that we've done with these um, on ring barking and girdling. Uh, you need to know where the uh, ring barking and girdling has occurred. You need to know to what depth and you need to know whether and how much of the trunk or branch has been affected. So we know, for example, that trees have survived ring barking and girdling to 50% of their trunk vascular tr tr um, tissues. And we know that in young uh, uh, trees of uh, river red gum, um, uh, uh, the common plane tree and some of our acacia species, they've survived from um, having uh, ring barking and girdling to 60%, 70%, 90%, or even 100% of their trunk. So we know that some species, some woody weed species, are really hard uh, to kill. And uh, in, in your part of the world, for example, beech and poplar, uh, some maple species have been reported to be very difficult uh, to kill from ring barking. We also know that as little as 10% vascular, vascular connection can be enough for trees to remain healthy, provided the tree is growing in good conditions, is kept free of stress, pests and diseases. What other effects of ring barking and girdling are quite interesting. So quite often ring barking causes an increasing in fruiting and flowering, and that's sometimes used in horticulture. Um, we've also found that uh, what you can find is that uh, the, the response uh, to girdling and ring barking um, usually leaves about 10 to 20 percent of the vascular connection. So you don't ring barking completely if you want to get uh, some of these horticultural effects that allow high, higher levels of um, carbohydrate to remain in the canopy, uh, better fruit production, more flowering and so on. You don't girdle all the way around the trunk or all the way around the branch to get those sorts of effects. We decided to do some research um, on three species that we commonly use in Melbourne, Australia. And these were the river red gum, the common plane tree, or, or the London plane, and uh, what we call uh, blackwood acacia melanoxylin. And we ring bark these at 60, 75, 90, and 100 percent using the definitions of ring barking and girdling. And we used different depths of cut, but what we found is that there was no difference uh, because what the only treatment that killed the trees was 100%. All the specimens survived even 90% ring barking or girdling. Now, this was probably because the experiment was conducted over a 13 week period. Um, the, the, the plants didn't die because the trees were young, vigorous, and they simply grew over the cuts. So it shows you how resilient young trees can be. But in some other experiments, we found that uh, if you have a severe ring barking, then you get slower bud burst in the following spring. So even if the tree doesn't die, there, has a, there is an impact. Uh, we also found that in all of these species, if you um, ring bark seriously, then the number of fruits produced declines significantly, uh, usually less than half, sometimes uh, about a third of what would happen on a healthy tree. And we also found, of course, that in severe treatments, uh, quite a number of branches were shed from the young trees. Uh, and if you went to a the more extreme girdling and ring barking, the greater the shedding was. There are other more subtle effects that ring barking and girdling have on these trees. So for example, uh, in undamaged controls, we found that the um, plants grew much more quickly. Uh, they had 
uh, shoot tip extension double that of ring bark trees. Uh, the infection of psyllids on some of these species, which are little um, sap sucking leaf, sap sucking insects, uh, was much, much higher in uh, ring bark trees than in the controls. And we probably know why that was the case, because the psyllids attacked the trees that were stressed because they were mobilising uh, sugars. Whereas in the acacias, which are affected by a leaf blight in Australia, the leaf blight didn't impact on the uh, ringbark trees, but it did on the controls that hadn't been ringbarked. So what you find there is that ringbarking and girdling have much more subtle effects on tree biology and physiology than just whether the tree lives or dies. And this makes you realize that there is a complex set of physiological responses taking place. Um, even if the ring barking is in, is, uh, or girdling is incomplete, the trees have been injured and their response to pests, diseases and stress will vary. Now, if you've got a ring bark tree, is there anything you can do? And the answer is yes, there's lots of things you can do. The first thing, if, if you've got a situation where bark has been stripped or detached from a tree, put it back. Put it back as quickly as you can, keeping the tissues moist and making sure the orientation of the bark that's been displaced is maintained. In other words, the section pointing up remains pointing up. Just put it back. Um, because there's a very good chance, depending on the season, that it will naturally graft. And this is particularly important if you've got trees that have been damaged by vehicle accidents or by deliberate acts of vandalism. There are a whole range of um, horticultural techniques uh, that you can see here, bridge grafting, where you place um, uh, cyan wood from the tree that's been damaged, you insert it under the bark, and you are attempting to graft a whole lot of sections. This is a technical operation. It's quite difficult. It can take time. It's quite costly. But for a valuable tree, it's well worth the while. So bridge grafting does work. It can be seasonal and it can be species dependent, but it's well worth the while if you've got an old or very significant tree. Uh, approach grafting is where you grow young seedlings around the trunk of the tree. Uh, usually, if you can get them, the progeny of the tree itself, and you effectively graft the trunks of those young trees back into the uh, old tree, and you're hoping that the graft will take and you'll have root system supplying water and other materials to the part of the tree that remains above. It's quite technical. Uh, it doesn't look good and would only be done in very, very rare circumstances for a very valuable tree. So these techniques make you realise that if you're going to deal with a very old and significant tree that's been seriously ringbarked, you know that these approaches are going to be expensive, they require quite a lot of skill, and you're going to require follow-up, often for months, if not years, after you've made these corrective treatments. So as we conclude this presentation, um, I'm just wanting to make everyone think about what happens with ring barking and girdling. Use the terms precisely. The fact that a tree has been ring barked or girdled doesn't mean that it will necessarily uh, die. Arboricultural treatments, particularly if applied rapidly and within hours to replace bark and to provide good conditions for the tree, can really make a difference as to whether the tree will survive ring barking or girdling. If you've got um, good callus production uh, and good conditions, that callus can grow very, very fast and you may get, you may get a growing over uh, a, a girdled or ring bark section of tree uh, in a matter of months. We know that trees can survive um, with as little as 10 to 20 percent of vascular connection or even less if they're young and healthy. The do nothing option to the tree may be an appropriate response because if these trees are young and vigorous and really producing lots of callus, then leave them alone, see what happens. That's good arboriculture.
the last thing I want to say is to point out that trees really are amazingly resilient and it really does come as a surprise that you might only need 10% of vascu vascular connection between roots and foliage to maintain a healthy tree for a number of decades. I wish to acknowledge my uh, colleague, um, Sarah Priestley, who did the work on some of those grafted trees, my students in a graduate certificate program who were also very interested in this topic. And I also acknowledge the, uh, the work of uh, Dr. Uh, Erin Moore, linguist, for reading and helping with the, uh, the, the PowerPoint and the transcript uh, that I've been using to accompany this presentation. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this session. Trees in every country. Trees, you know we can. Work together and learn what we need to meet the challenge.